Why were sailors so unhealthy? 16th to the 18th century. As the British Empire spread across the globe in the 16th and 17th centuries, a whole new set of challenges started to emerge, like how to live at sea for many months without letting most of your sailors get sick or die. From the 16th to the 18th century, the entire world went through great political and cultural transformations due to the exchanges happening through sea trade. The sea had become the main scenario of world politics. As longer and longer voyages became more common, sailors started to become afflicted with a strange and horrible disease. It would appear after just a few weeks at sea, and at first it was just an unexplained weakness and fatigue, accompanied by a slight fever and an increased irritability. But if the condition continued, after a few months, it would become increasingly more severe, as a sailor's gums would become sore and start to bleed, followed by tooth loss as well as agonizing headaches. The sailor's joints would then swell up and become painful and tender. Their eyesight would also deteriorate, their vision becoming blurred and sensitive to light. Then jaundice would set in, where the skin and eyes start to yellow, and soon after that, the victim would fall into a coma and die a short time later. But oddly, if they made it back to land and were given the chance to rest and recuperate, they would mysteriously make a full and speedy recovery. Such it was that a lot of sailors had the disease many times in their lives. At this stage, the commonly held view was that scurvy, as it was being called, was a digestive imbalance caused by the hardships of life at sea and the naval diet. Others believed it was caused by excess of black bile or laziness. The standard Royal Navy diet at the time lacked fresh meat, and the crew had to rely upon salted pork and beef for their protein, along with whatever fish and turtles they could catch. Their weekly ration during the 18th century consisted of six pounds of salted meat, which was the equivalent of the meat from 24 quarter-pound burgers. Along with this were small quantities of butter and cheese and a large amount of biscuit and oatmeal, totaling around 10 pounds. The biscuit was called hardtack and was inexpensive, being made from flour, water, and salt. Its major drawback was that it was tasteless and prone to bug infestations like weevils, a small, ugly, snout-nosed insect. There was also a daily pint of beer per man along with a watered-down shot of rum. If times were tough, rats would be caught and eaten, which had the added bonus of keeping the onboard vermin population under control. But most importantly, fresh fruit and vegetables were only served for the first part of the voyage as they would eventually spoil. So for most of these long trips, the sailors' diet completely lacked any source of vitamin C. So to try and cure scurvy, the Royal Navy introduced a number of measures, like increasing the beer ration, introducing the eating of sauerkraut, which was a fermented cabbage, and issuing a sugary drink made of malt and a thing called wort, which was the side product of the brewing process. None of these were particularly effective. In fact, one of these so-called cures was actually extremely dangerous to one's health. It was called the elixir of vitriol, consisting of sulfuric acid taken with alcoholic spirits that were infused with a mixture of various spices and mixed with barley water. Soon, this mysterious affliction was causing such a problem on long-distance voyages that the Royal Navy was forced to take action, because up to 50% of those sick with scurvy died in the beginning of the age of sail, and still one in seven sick sailors died of it in the 18th century. Around this time, it was not just the fleets of the great European powers that were suffering from the ravages of scurvy. Pirates, who were a major world problem in those days, also suffered greatly. In some ways, pirates were hit even harder by scurvy, as they were limited by where they could pick up fresh supplies as they were outlaws. To aid them was punishable by death. So they were often forced to rely on food supplies from the ships they plundered, which often meant their diet was even more deficient in vitamin C than the likes of the British or French navies. And to complicate matters further, pirate ships rarely carried any kind of doctor on board. So pirate ships often relied on good fortune when it came to injury or disease, and a man handy with a saw if it was time for an amputation. The famous pirate Blackbeard was unusual for his time and insisted on keeping a well-stocked medicine chest on board with a selection of herbs, assorted knives, razors, cauterizing irons, cupping glasses, stitching quill, and needles. Then, in 1747, a Scottish doctor named James Lind aboard the British warship HMS Salisbury, in his experiments, discovered a link between a sailor's poor diet at sea and the true cause of scurvy, and that it might be cured by eating fresh citrus fruit. But his findings were overshadowed by his work on clinical medical experiment methods and the importance of good hygiene, causing his work on scurvy to be overlooked. In 1793, the much-respected Rear Admiral Gardner insisted, after being advised by the physician Gilbert Blaine, 
that some of his ships heading on a four-month voyage to India carry lemon juice to be issued every day to the crew. Gardner had seen firsthand how ineffective the so-called cures for scurvy were, but had been impressed by how the Spanish Navy was getting the problem under control by regular doses of lemon juice. There was much astonishment when his small fleet of ships arrived in India, and not a single crew member had gone down with scurvy the entire trip, something completely unheard of at the time on such a long voyage. The Royal Navy Sick and Hurt Board quickly recommended to the British Admiralty that lemon juice be issued as a daily ration to the crews on all British warships in the future. Gilbert Blaine was appointed as the commissioner to the Sick and Hurt Board in 1795 and used his experience with the results Gardner had shown to persuade the Admiralty to issue lemon juice as a daily ration to the entire Royal Navy fleet. Almost overnight, scurvy became a thing of the past. In time, science identified that scurvy was not a disease or ailment, but in fact a deficiency in vitamin C caused by a lack of fresh fruit and vegetables. Unbelievable plague cures. The Middle Ages. The Black Death. The bubonic plague, more commonly known as the Black Death, due to the black buboes that would swell in the armpits and groins of victims, decimated the population of Europe during the Middle Ages, from 1347 to 1351. These buboes would swell, sometimes as large as an egg, and turn black before eventually rupturing, oozing blood and pus, putting the person in agony. Other symptoms of the plague included fever, rashes, difficulty breathing, and vomiting blood. We associate the name the Black Death with this initial devastating outbreak, but in reality, the bubonic plague continued to affect and devastate Europe for the next few centuries. During the outbreak, the plague spread rapidly from the Middle East across continental Europe and then jumped the channel to the British Isles. As terror and disease ran rampant throughout Europe, people searched for answers. Some believe that God was punishing the human race for their sins through divine intervention or in the form of the disease. One of the most prominent theories was delivered to the King of France by a respected medical institution in France. They said that the cause of the plague was the conjunction of three planets in 1345, which then caused a great pestilence in the air. This was followed by the bad air theory or miasma theory, which became widely accepted everywhere. However, the Black Death was actually caused by bites from the fleas carried on rats. Due to the high death toll, streets were often littered with bodies that were left outside for the death collectors as they were to be taken away and buried in mass graves known as plague pits. Life had become so tragic that as one Italian citizen in 1348, Agnolo di Tura stated, there was no one who wept for any death for all awaited death, and so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. As the death toll increased and people continued to be struck down by the disease throughout Europe and entire families were being wiped out, plague doctors began to get desperate and creative with so-called plague cures. These are some of those cures bloodletting. One way physicians and plague doctors attempted to cure the Black Death was through bloodletting. Bloodletting was common during the Middle Ages, as it was believed that it expelled harmful humors from within the body that were causing the sickness. The practice of bloodletting involved leeching or cutting near to the site of the infection, in this case, the bubo. However, cutting into the skin to drain the blood often led to further infection as the immune system was already weak and health conditions were unsanitary given the circumstances. Plague doctors would also sometimes lance the buboes releasing a putrid odor along with blood and pus. Sweating. Sweating was also a popular cure. In this case, the doctor would provide the patient with medicine that would raise their temperature. The idea was to make the patient sweat out the corruption from the blood that the disease caused. It was seen as a last resort treatment. Treacle One of the more pleasant ways of curing the plague was to use treacle. 
a type of syrup made of unrefined sugar. The catch was that the treacle had to be aged for at least 10 years to be an effective cure for the Black Death. The reasoning behind this cure was that the substance, which by that point would be horrific smelling and very sticky, was going to rid the body of the disease while simultaneously counteracting the effects of the disease. The treacle was drank in its thick syrupy form and was thought to completely rid the plague from the victim's body. While seemingly improbable, it is possible that over the course of the 10-year aging period that disease-fighting molds may have developed within the treacle that could help fight off the plague. Whether this saved anyone is largely unknown. Bathe in Urine Whilst we might find this a disgusting cure by today's clean standards, this isn't altogether unsurprising. Urine was believed to have healing properties and had been associated with medical issues since the days of Galen and Hippocrates. Urine was often examined in flasks by physicians who matched the color and consistency to illustrations. Victims of the plague were given urine to bathe in, with the thought being that it would relieve their symptoms. This was then taken further, and some victims were given urine to drink. Crushed Emeralds Unsurprisingly, this cure was more for the wealthy plague sufferer. The idea was that swallowing the precious stones would help to restore balance amongst the humors and therefore cure the victim. Emeralds weren't the only precious jewels used. Other minerals such as pearls were said to be effective. The stones were usually ground down and mixed with water to form a sparkly potation, one that was laced with little bits of emerald that probably felt like broken glass. Covering yourself in human excrement. Doctors would make a paste from human feces, flower roots, and some tree resins. The buboes would then be cut open and the paste would be smeared on. The open wound would then be tightly wrapped to keep the paste inside. Live in a sewer. On the face of it, this is a very counterproductive cure. However, medieval doctors thought that the plague was caused by the air. It was thought that the disgusting smells of the sewer would stop the less smelly but disease-ridden air from coming near them and therefore infecting them. Sadly, not only was it a disgusting cure, it also wasn't very effective as it often exposed victims to a variety of other nasty diseases. Whipping Yourself the Middle Ages were a particularly religious time and it's no wonder that people turned to God when they got the disease. They thought that it might be God's punishment for being sinful and that the only way to a cure was to punish themselves. They did this through flagellation. This was where they went into the streets and whipped themselves and each other to punish themselves for their sins in the hope that God would cure them. Dinner Parties some doctors thought that stress made people more susceptible to the plague, so they recommended eating their meals with others in order to promote merrymaking and reduce stress. In Florence, Marchione di Capo Stefani describes how people used to take turns to host the dinners, although often two or three people wouldn't turn up. This cure helped to spread the plague more because of close contact with the infected. The Live Chicken Cure this may be the most puzzling of the plague cures. During the medieval period into the 18th century, a popular cure was the live chicken cure or the Vickery method. The live chicken treatment included taking a rooster, plucking its backside, and placing its rump onto the buboes of the plague victim. Supposedly, the bear chicken would draw out the poison in the buboes, therefore curing the plague victim of the terrible disease. The live chicken treatment was so popular throughout Europe that it was integrated into normal medical procedures for the plague victims by the 16th century. Some physicians believed that the heat from the chicken was what drew the poison from the buboes, while others simply believed the chicken balanced the humors within the body. Quarantine The most tried and true of the cures was the use of quarantine which had begun to be implemented in Italy in 1348. 
Quarantine policies required that individuals, even entire families, be confined to or shut up in their homes until they had recovered from the plague and then be confined for a further 40 days afterwards. For many, that recovery never happened. Bodies littered the streets in front of the isolated houses. For when a family member died in quarantine, they would be left on the doorstep to be taken away to the plague pits. While plague quarantine policies did work in some ways, the death toll in London was still high at around 10,400 people, 7.5% of the city's population in 1636. Of course, these cures were not very successful and eventually the Black Death just went away. Later, it would return time and time again across the next few centuries. As time went on and medicine became more refined, doctors began to understand what remedies worked and why. Sanitation and quarantine became more and more important as cures, while others such as flagellation became less prominent. You might wonder why these cures were ever tried and if people really believe them to work. The answer is yes. Physicians and patients really believed that these cures were the right thing to do in stopping the plague. It is likely that the cures became widespread because someone tried them and it appeared to work. Word would spread and more people would try them. That means there were probably more crazy cures that were out there that we don't know about. The Spanish Flu, 1918 through 1920. 1918, the year in which World War I ended, is one of the most significant years in world history. But even as the final stages of that terrible conflict were being played out, a second deadlier threat to humanity was underway. An influenza virus, influenza type A, subtype H1N1 to be precise. The Spanish flu, as the virus is now known, made its way around the world mindless of human politics, borders, and morality, infecting soldiers and civilians, rich and poor alike. Its spread was so wide-reaching that the only continent it left untouched was Antarctica. By the time the virus had run its course, approximately 500 million people, roughly one-third of the world's population, had fallen ill. Conservative estimates placed the death toll at 20 million people, but it's now widely accepted that the much more likely figure lies somewhere between 50 to 100 million. If the higher end of this estimate is correct, then the Spanish flu was responsible for more deaths than both World War I and World War II combined. Over the course of three distinct waves, the virus killed more people over a shorter period of time than even history's most famous pandemic, the Black Death. Symptoms included a severe headache, a high fever, a sore throat accompanied by a racking cough, and body aches so agonizing that some patients describe the pain as being similar to that caused by breaking bones. As the disease progressed, brownish patches appeared on the cheeks. In the final stages, the extremities began to take on a bluish appearance caused by lack of oxygen in the blood. This was called heliotrope cyanosis and led to the virus sometimes being referred to as the blue death. Bleeding from the ears and nose was also common, as was frothing from the mouth caused by fluid in the lungs. Modern studies done on preserved lung tissue taken from victims of the pandemic suggest that in many cases, death was not caused directly by the flu virus itself, but rather from a secondary bacterial pneumonia. Unlike a normal seasonal flu, which usually only kills the very young or old, or those with an underlying health condition, the Spanish flu disproportionately affected healthy young adults. Approximately 50% of those who died were in their 20s and 30s. The reasons for this are still not entirely understood, but there are a couple of theories that have been proposed. The first of these is that the virus sometimes triggered a cytokine storm, an extreme overreaction of the immune system which resulted in the lungs filling up with bodily fluids and death occurring due to drowning. The healthier the immune system, the more likely it is believed to be for this reaction to occur. The second suggestion is known as original antigenic sin. There is evidence to suggest that an individual's lifelong immune response to flu is determined by their earliest encounter with the flu virus. For many young adults in 1918, this would most likely have occurred during an earlier epidemic, the Russian flu of 1889 to 1890, which is believed to have been an H3 virus rather than an H1 virus like the Spanish flu. Despite the name, the virus almost certainly didn't originate in Spain, 
it became known as the Spanish flu due to Spain's neutrality throughout World War I. Countries participating in the conflict had reporting restrictions in place as they did not want stories that could affect morale or give an indication of weakness to their enemies to become widespread. While in neutral Spain, there was no such blackout and the country's reporters were free to write stories about the contagion. The fact that the Spanish king fell ill only helped to further the association of the country with the virus in the minds of the rest of the world. As to where the first outbreak actually did occur, there are three main theories. It's widely accepted by scientists that all flu viruses originate in birds before mutating and making the jump to humans, sometimes directly and sometimes via a third species such as pigs. For these crossover events to take place, a few factors need to be in place. Most importantly, there needs to be close contact between animals and humans. And secondly, a large population of humans in which the virus can take hold and spread. Etap in northern France was home to a huge allied military hospital, and it also lies on a migratory bird route. In 1916, the hospital suffered an outbreak of a disease with symptoms recorded by the doctors there that would prove to be remarkably similar to those of the Spanish flu. In 1917, China too suffered a disease outbreak. At the time, this was attributed to pneumonic plague, but later reassessments have suggested that this was perhaps a misdiagnosis of what was actually the Spanish flu. Thousands of Chinese workers were later transported to Europe via North America to provide support behind British and French lines on the Western Front. China seems to have suffered less than other countries during the main pandemic, which has led to the suggestion that the population already had some degree of immunity to exposure from earlier outbreaks. Until further testing is carried out, it's impossible to determine if either of these events were really precursors to the pandemic or entirely unrelated incidents. Finally, there is some evidence that the virus may have had its origins in the United States, most likely in Haskell County, Kansas. This was a rural part of the country that is also on a migratory bird route and, much like China and France, suffered from an unusual outbreak. Wherever the virus did come from, the first undisputed recorded case occurred in the USA. On the morning of the 11th of March, 1918, U.S. Army soldier Private Albert Gitchell reported to the infirmary at Camp Funston in Kansas, just 300 miles from Haskell, with flu-like symptoms. The disease soon spread through the camp and then made its way to other military bases throughout the U.S. By April, it had spread to Bordeaux and France, most likely through American troop movements. And within weeks, it was rife within both Allied and German forces across the continent. In June, British soldiers began arriving at the hospital in Etaples, suffering from what was then termed pyrexia of unknown origin. Medics working there noted the similarity of this condition to the previous 1916 outbreak. This first wave of the virus abated after just a few weeks. Any respite, however, proved to be brief, and by the middle of August, the second wave was well underway. This was by far the most deadly stage of the outbreak. It's believed that the virus had mutated again, and in the process had become much more dangerous. October saw the highest rate of mortality, and in the United States, it still has the record for the deadliest month in history, with nearly 200,000 Americans dying. In Philadelphia, city officials, against mounting medical advice, allowed a parade to go ahead. On the 28th of September, 200,000 Philadelphians took to the streets to enjoy the spectacle and raise money for the war effort. The result proved to be disastrous. The large gathering was the perfect breeding ground for the virus, and within 72 hours, all of the city's 31 hospitals were at full capacity. Schools, churches, and other public spaces were closed down in an attempt to slow the progress of the disease. But despite these measures, within two weeks of the parade, more than 4,500 people had died from the flu. Newspapers were soon full of adverts from both reputable brands and snake oil salesmen peddling their wares to a public desperate for any method of protection. People also turned to folk remedies, such as onions and asafoetida. As useless as these treatments would have been, actual medical advice was not always much better and at times included the use of strychnine, belladonna, and kerosene. A concerted effort was made to develop a vaccine, but this was greatly hindered by the fact that the flu was still believed to be bacterial rather than viral in nature. To make matters worse, aspirin dosing and the effects of aspirin poisoning were not properly understood, resulting in far higher doses of the drug being given to some patients than would be given today. We can never be entirely sure how much of a factor this was, but it's possible that the overuse of aspirin contributed to the mortality rate in some countries. Despite the best attempts of governments and the medical profession, the spread of the contagion was relentless. 
Hospitals ran out of beds. Morgues exceeded their maximum capacities, and entire countries ran out of coffins in which to bury the dead. In the U.S., the average life expectancy dropped by an average of 12 years, and in the U.K., 1918 became the first year since records began where the death toll exceeded the birth rate. The average mortality rate for the virus was around 2.5%, but in some countries this was far higher. In Fiji, 14% of the population died in a little over two weeks. In Western Samoa, as much as 25% of the population was wiped out. In terms of total numbers, India seemed to have been the worst affected country, losing at least 17 million people over the course of the pandemic. A third wave struck in early 1919. The most prominent casualty of this was the American President Woodrow Wilson, who was taken ill while in Paris negotiating the Treaty of Versailles. His bout of illness and resulting confusion is considered by some historians to be at least a partial explanation for the unfairness of the treaty, which of course was a major factor in why World War II came about. Several smaller outbreaks continued into the 1920s, but the Spanish flu had lost a lot of its strength, and the mortality rate was significantly reduced. The science behind the sudden decline in the virus's virility is, once again, not entirely clear. But increased immunity within the human population and a likely further mutation of the virus were probable factors. How did you survive the Spanish flu? 1918 to 1920. There you lay in your hospital bed, bitter that you hadn't been able to get over to Europe in time to join the last big push against Imperial Germany that would finally end World War I. You had attempted to join the U.S. Army a few months before in mid-1918 at the age of 16 years old, but was turned down to being too young and not having parental consent. Not one to be deterred using a forged birth certificate and a forged father's signature on the parental consent form, you managed to get into a Red Cross military detachment as an ambulance driver. But then you feel your luck changes for the worse as you go down with what seems like a particularly nasty strain of seasonal flu that's going around and you end up being hospitalized for a few weeks. Crucially, this delays you being shipped out to the front line in faraway France. So when you finally get there by ship transporter, the war has been over for a month. You'd think you would be safe now, as you don't become one of the 116,516 Americans killed in the brutal fighting that was the First World War. But unknown to you, a different kind of horror is awaiting you in France. For this year's flu strain that it suggested originated in China earlier in the year has spread across America, mutated into a much more lethal variety, and now has its epicenter of infection in France. In those three countries, the news about influenza was suppressed by censorship and self-censorship to maintain wartime morale. The news about the virus spread widely when King Alphonse XIII of neutral Spain fell ill. This flu strain became known as Spanish flu, and it was mistakenly thought to have come from that country. It would eventually infect a third of the world's population over the next 18 months, kill an estimated 675,000 Americans, and kill between 50 to 100 million people worldwide. This is the modern-day equivalent of the entire populations of the capital cities of Abu Dhabi, Beijing, Bangkok, Berlin, Brussels, Copenhagen, Lima, Lisbon, London, Madrid, Manila, Moscow, Paris, Riyadh, Seoul, Tokyo, Vienna, Warsaw, and Washington, D.C., all dying from the infection. Globally, more people were killed by the Spanish flu than in the First World War. But initially, you were not unduly worried about this outbreak and the increasing number of people around you getting it. For you had survived it already, and even the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson had been violently ill with it, but had gone on to make a full recovery. So you and your co-workers are not worried at the moment. The symptoms at first were much like normal flu, fever, fatigue, muscle and joint pain, headache and lack of appetite, but then often developed into a bacterial pneumonia that caused the lungs to be destroyed and made the patient violently cough up blood. This led the Spanish flu to have a mortality rate which was thought to be as high as 20% of those infected. But then as the death toll starts to rapidly rise and morgues begin to overflow with dead bodies, you start to realize this is more than just your normal everyday flu. So what's the best way for you to avoid getting this terrible strain of the flu virus 
Well, even if you got an earlier version of the flu, it didn't ensure you would not get the latter, much more dangerous one. Hoping the government-imposed quarantine would work, though a good and sensible measure, could not be relied upon as this flu strain spread so fast. By the time its lethal danger was fully recognized, it was far too late and had spread to the four corners of the globe. But if you could avoid public places and limit physical contact with people, this could greatly improve your chances of surviving this pandemic. Washing your hands, especially after you've been out in public, was very important as the flu virus could live on certain surfaces for up to 48 hours and up to 12 hours on clothes. Though bear in mind that everyday soap is of limited effectiveness, as it's good for cleaning dirt away but not necessarily good at sanitizing. Resist dosing yourself with too many painkillers like aspirin, as that could surprisingly save your life too. For at the height of the pandemic, there was a spike in deaths from accidental aspirin overdoses, as people didn't know or fully understand the correct dosage. So reading the information on any medicine you're taking is a must. Sadly, a lot of things you could do to help your survival were either not understood in your day and age, or simply weren't available as they would be in the next century. You would think a face mask would help, but to be really effective, you needed to use a certain type that fits around the mouth and neck tightly. The most common cause of death from Spanish flu was from secondary bacterial infection, chiefly pneumonia. In the future, this can be treated highly effectively by antibiotics, along with a saline drip to rehydrate you. But this was no option as neither were available to you in 1919 at the height of the pandemic. Also, vaccination against this disease was not an option for you either. Though there had been successful vaccines for smallpox and rabies, vaccines were still in their infancy, and it wasn't until the 1950s that viruses and how to combat them were starting to be really understood. So, if you did become ill, bed rest and drinking lots of fluids were your best way to a full recovery. As for you, you did survive the outbreak and went on to win Academy Awards for animated movies like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day. For you are Walt Elias Disney. Leech Collector. Disgusting jobs in history. Leeches were used throughout history in medicine to relieve all kinds of ailments, from headaches to hysteria. Hieroglyphics painted on walls show ancient Egyptians using leeches to treat patients. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, barber surgeons and plague doctors applied leeches to suck out the bad blood during plagues. But in the early 1800s, there was a leech craze, which spread throughout Europe and America like no other, which became an important part of the bloodletting process used by many medical practitioners. Medical practitioners applied leeches to the patient's mouth and inside of the throat using a leech glass, and sometimes patients even swallowed them. The peak of the leech mania was in the 1830s, when tens of millions of leeches were used every year in France, England, Germany, and the United States to the extent that demand was outstripping supply. The leech collector became a familiar sight. Although old horses were used if available, the leech collector would commonly wade into the bogs and marshes themselves bare-legged. They did this so the leeches would latch onto their legs, thinking they were cattle, and start drawing the blood with their front teeth. The leech collector was traditionally a female occupation, done by poor women in the countryside in areas such as the Lake District in England. While the job wasn't physically demanding, there were obvious dangers. The leech collectors could suffer from a severe loss of blood or infection. Leeches would suck onto the collector's legs for up to 20 minutes, and the wounds could continue to bleed for 10 hours. When the leech collector had had enough, they placed the leeches in a bucket and sold them to a medical practitioner. Leech collecting was not a well-paid job and could only be done during the hotter months, as leeches are less active during the colder seasons. The occupation went on the decline, as the human blood-sucking species of leech was becoming extinct in Europe due to over-collecting and the medical value of bloodletting declined in the late 19th century as new discoveries were made. You in 2023 versus the past. Thanks to the technological advances of the modern age, in 2023, life is pretty safe. In the past, however, many of the things we take for granted now were likely a death sentence for our ancestors. Amputations, 
In 2023, if you need to get an amputation, then it's usually a fairly safe procedure and performed by highly skilled surgeons. Pumped with anesthesia and put to sleep, an amputee nowadays never has to witness their own dismemberment. But from the first recorded amputation 31,000 years ago in Borneo until the early 20th century, if you had a serious infection or injury that required amputation, the experience was brutally different. With perhaps only a little opium or alcohol to slightly numb the excruciating pain, a typical procedure in the 17th century would start with the patient being fully awake. What followed was a wrestling match between the surgeon's helpers and the patient as the individual was grappled onto the bed and desperately told to keep still. The surgeon began by making two deep incisions with a sharp knife, upon which the patient started to scream in agony. Then another knife was used to cut down the flesh until it reached the periosteum layer, the membranous tissue that covers the bone. This was scraped off in preparation for the most traumatic stage of the operation. Making sure to have a spare on hand in case it broke, an implement was next used to saw off the bone, with the man tasked with handling the limb focusing on holding it steady in order to stop it from snapping completely off. Once the bone was fully dismembered, the stump was either cauterized or stitched up. If the surgical procedure didn't kill you, the bacteria from unwashed, rusty instruments usually caused an accompanying infection that would finish you off afterwards. Vaccinations in 2023, the perfection of the vaccination process has helped protect us from nasty pathogens and ghastly diseases, but in the past, early misguided attempts to inoculate against awful sickness often had disastrous consequences. During the American Civil War, although Union and Confederate soldiers fought to the death, they did have one common enemy. According to the most recent estimates, disease killed two out of every three combatants, with smallpox being among the most lethal maladies and reportedly leading to the deaths of 40% of Union soldiers who contracted it. The most common method by which doctors procured vaccinations was to infect small children with cowpox, a closely related and less dangerous form of smallpox, take fluid from a developing cowpox pustule, and then directly inject it into the bloodstream of a soldier. Widespread vaccination, however, was impossible because of the scarcity of doctors who knew how to carry out this delicate procedure, with one doctor for every 324 Confederate soldiers and every 133 Union troops. As a result, combatants began to inoculate themselves using rusty pocket knives and nails to make self-inflicted wounds before piercing a comrade's pustule and coating their gash with the fluids that seeped out. Such a method did more harm than good, for as well as catching any infections from the unsterilized points they had stabbed themselves with, many soldiers mistook the smallpox carbuncles that they hoped would safeguard them from syphilis blisters accidentally contaminating themselves with an illness which, left untreated, could lead to paralysis, blindness, heart disease, and death. Travel in 2023, we have the luxury of traveling incredibly long distances in a very short amount of time, in comfort. But in the past, if you wanted to do the same thing, you might not survive the journey or even the destination. Today, excluding stopovers, it takes an average of 20 hours to travel from Edinburgh Airport to Panama and return. But for a group of intrepid Scottish adventurers at the end of the 17th century, this same journey was a lot longer and a lot less pleasant. In 1693, after establishing the Company of Scotland trading to Africa and the Indies, successful businessman William Patterson proposed that the Scottish should colonize the Isthmus of Panama and set up a trading post. Envisioning that their nation could financially benefit by becoming intermediaries of Atlantic and Pacific trade, 1,200 Scots dreaming of a better life on distant shores set sail from Layth Harbor in Edinburgh on July 12, 1698. Arriving at the Bay of Darien in November 1698, many on board had already died or were already sick by the time the group had disembarked. Seven months later, tropical diseases had killed 400 of the colonists while the rest of the expeditionary force were stricken with yellow fever and were so weak they could barely move. With the fate of the first wave unknown, a second voyage was sent out, and by the time it reached the cursed settlement, 160 people had already succumbed to illness en route. The new arrivals quickly realized they had stumbled into a nightmare, and soon 16 people a day were dying. The remnants were rescued four months later, but the journey home would also prove fatal with shipwrecks and disease killing a further 340 survivors. By the end, only one ship returned to Laith, and 2,000 people had perished. Winter 
For most of us in 2023 who live in warm and insulated homes, winter is a season of only mild discomfort. While those enchanted by snowy landscapes or Christmas merrymaking even consider it the best season of all. In the past though, winter was definitely everyone's least favorite time. For the majority of our ancestors, the festive period was instead symbolically associated with old age, poverty, and death, who also had the misfortune to experience winters that were often colder and longer. One such occasion was the volcanic winter of 536, when average temperatures dropped by as much as 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit because of a cloud of volcanic ash that darkened the skies for 18 months. In what is generally regarded by historians and scientists alike as the worst year to be alive on record, these unusual climatic conditions, which ushered in widespread global crop failures, caused it to snow in China during summer and created, according to the Roman scholar Cassiodorus, a winter without storms, spring without mildness, and a summer without heat. It's been attributed to the 6th century eruption of a volcano called Ilopongo, located in El Salvador, which expelled 10.5 cubic miles of dense rock. This cataclysm was thankfully a one-off event, but for the people of the Middle Ages, global cooling was far more prolonged. The result of a decrease in sunspot activity or further volcanic eruptions, the Little Ice Age lasted from 1300 to 1850 and saw global average temperatures plummet again by as much as 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In parts of Scandinavia and Switzerland, villages and farms were wiped out by advancing ice glaciers, and in the 17th century, blizzards were recorded as far south as Florida on some occasions. In addition, the 1709 Great Winter in Europe was so cold that thousands of the poorest people died in their sleep of hypothermia, while Paris was completely cut off by snow for three months, forcing some people to feast on frozen corpses to survive. Beauty in 2023, applying cosmetics usually isn't too life-threatening, since they're required by law to go through a strict safety assessment before being allowed to hit the shelves. In the past, however, beauty products often cut short many lives. From as far back as 3500 BC, makeup lined with toxic chemicals such as lead was commonly used by women from all eras of history to whiten their skin, most famously by Queen Elizabeth I. Although prized for its face-smoothing qualities, lead makeup had the unfortunate side effect of making the user uglier as time went on, causing gray hair, dried-out skin, severe abdominal pain, and constipation. But when society cottoned on to the fact that lead was dangerous, an even more poisonous ingredient was found to replace it. Skin whitening products were next made out of arsenic, a chemical that kills red blood cells to create a paler complexion, and which was often nibbled on throughout the day in the form of a wafer. Women who chowed down on it gave themselves a variety of ailments such as nervous system damage, kidney damage, and baldness, which were often the precursors to an agonizing death. In the more enlightened 20th century, fashionistas were still permanently damaging themselves, among the deadliest fads involved being exposed to x-rays for up to 20 hours in order to remove unwanted hair. Although an effective treatment, patients would later have to deal with a raft of unwanted consequences, including skin thickening, atrophy, ulcerations, baldness, and ultimately, cancer. So, count yourself lucky that you live in 2023, because in the past, you wouldn't last.